First off, on our um, weekend of uh, looking to the future, it's uh, Simon Wigley and the Curse of Looking Backward. Well, good evening. Um, the title's called, uh, the title is The Curse of Looking mm -hmm. Backwards. Now, this obviously is a, a reference to Bellamy, but uh, as you'll see as I go on, it's also about the fact that when we think we're looking forwards into the future of utopias, we're actually looking backwards. Now, I want to start with a quote from the Communist Manifesto to, to set this into context. This is what Marx has to say about uh, socialism. The significance of what he calls critical utopian socialism and communism bears an inverse relation to historical development. In proportion as the modern class struggle develops and takes definite shape, this fantastic standing apart from the contest, these fantastic attacks on it, lose all practical value and all theoretical justification. Therefore, although the originators of these systems were, in many respects, revolutionary, their disciples have, in every case, formed mere reactionary sects. They hold fast by the original views of their masters in opposition to the progressive historical development of the proletariat. They therefore endeavour, and that consistently, to deaden the class struggle and to reconcile the class antagonisms. So, that, to, to my mind, is the Marxian position on utopias. But I'm going to go on and explain why. So, utopias are counter-revolutionary by, by this. Whilst utopias criticise existing society, they try to complete the bourgeois worldview uh, rather than abolishing it. They're looking backwards, not forwards. We live in uh, what so Marx would have considered a utopia today, in that instead of it being sort of like naked capitalism, we have what uh, he refers to in the, in the manifesto again as bourgeois socialism, which he defines as the bourgeois is a bourgeois for the sake of the working class. Now, if you speak to you know, the man on the Clapham omnibus today, he will tell you, or she will tell you, or whatever, uh, <coughs> funny place Clapham, uh, they, will, they, they will tell you that uh, whilst you know, cap, uh, capitalism may be an evil, it's a necessary evil, that we all profit by it, that we all get the crumbs from the table. Yeah? So it, it's not unusual to be utopian. We all start off, you know, we're trained. Uh, you know, we spend 13 years in an open prison called school learning to become utopians. Yeah? What I hope to do today is just to look at a materialist worldview, a materialist point of view, and to see why we should not think in this way, why we should think in what I believe is a Marxian way. So the thing about utopias is that they seem to be logical outcomes that transcend history. It seems to stand to reason. You know, they seem to be eternal laws that mean that people must behave in this way or that way. Um, but they are merely the exploration of bourgeois thoughts. You know, this is all that we know today. You know, that some total of our knowledge has grown up between within capitalist bourgeois society. That so everything that we know is bourgeois thought. Yeah? So um, utopias are basic, uh, basically they are capitalisms that never were. Is a good way of thinking about it. Now I will spend much of my talk explaining how this came to pass. Hopefully. Uh, I'll attempt to present a materialist account of the development of historical ideas, often paraphrasing Marx, I, uh, I do love quoting from Holy Scripture, uh, especially from his Paris manuscripts, which is like his early days when he was thinking to the theory and uh, going from being a young Hegelian to being a, uh, a communist, possibly even a Marxist. Uh, from this, I'll justify my comment, hopefully, that uh, utopias are bourgeois in nature and counter-revolutionary. I'll try and be as pictorial as possible in terms of presenting um, you know, pictorial ideas because you know, they're not easy for me, so I hope they're not easy for anyone else. Um, and I'll, I'll then see, given uh, my explanation of this development, I'll see what we can say about the future, what we could say about, instead of being utopian, what we can say practically <coughs> as communists, not just socialists, but communists what we can say about our approach to the future and how we should go about our plan rather than following utopias. Right. 
excuse me a moment. Right. Um, I want to split the discussion of materialism into two parts. Uh, you can split the discussion any way you like. But I want to just split it into the biological conditions that we find ourselves in, yeah, and what I call uh, the mathematical relationship between us, which is how we relate to each other as individuals within a society, which are quite different. Um, put simply, the biological is the structure of the organism, especially the structure of the brain. Uh, and the mathematical is the relationship between each other. I'm sorry, I'm going to pick this up because I've got nothing to read from and I want to look at people. Um, so where was I? Um, yeah, so this mathematical, as I'm saying, is the way that we as individuals relate to each other as social creatures that emerging from the same communal mass of ideas. Because there's no ideal, you know, original persons that have been down here from Earth or born from God. We start with nothing and the person develops within the mass of, uh, of ideas that we develop as, as creatures moving through history. So to the biological. The human brain is three pounds of meat. We know this, meat with a weak electric charges across it. We all know what one looks like. It's not a divine organ. There's no spark of illumination inside it. It just processes data. It's not the kind of thing that can divine like the, the nature of the universe or any other eternal truths, any more than one could map the heavens with a cracked monocle and a piece of string, or chart the ocean's depth, uh, chart the ocean's depths from the susurration of a seashell at one's ear. The brain is finite. This means that we cannot set up logical structures and apply them outside of our particular experience as if they're eternal laws. We cannot perceive the infinite. Where we seem to find perfection, in fact, we meet the limitations of the brain. Things like dimensionality, integers, past and future. The, the way that we structure our lives are not to rules beyond the heavens. They are about the way that the brain uh, approaches things. For example, we have a ballistic sense as, as apes swinging through the trees, which has been shown we basically use to develop our future tenses, etc., etc. Some of these constraints we can transcend. Some of them we can't. A good way of thinking about this, again trying to be pictorial, is to imagine an astronomer looking through their telescope and seeing a band of light stretching across the heavens. Is this the edge of the universe? Or is it a scratch on the lens? The latter opinion is by far the most sensible and likely. An astronomer is keenly aware of the limitations of their equipment since it's outside of them and subject to their scrutiny and they'd be unlikely to publish such findings to say, I have just discovered a, a line across the, across the heavens. Um, however, we tend to be in the position of uh, Schiaparelli. I don't know if anyone's heard of Schiaparelli. Uh, he was the one who saw canals on Mars. Now, he saw those canals on Mars, not because of faulty equipment with his telescopes, yeah, but because of faulty biology. Wish fulfillment coupled with the human propensity for pattern recognition. So you look for patterns, where they're not there. Yeah? Much of what represents itself as eternal truth today falls into this category of canals on Mars. We are conjuring patterns, and when we find those patterns, we think that they're eternal. Now, the human mind processes its impressions. It's not just an endless stream of raw data. Philosophers and the religious may consider this contemplation of the, uh, this contemplation of the divine or of eternal truths. In fact, it's merely a process of abstraction from what is already known, and is limited in value to this. Yeah? When we abstract from our impressions, creating new impressions, they can be as like as life, for all that we know them to be false. For example, if you have a dream that a thousand foot tall purple octopus secretly rules the world, it's not that this knowledge is secretly beamed into your mind by occult masters, or that these thoughts result from your exhaustive understanding of the ways of the world. But it's probably that you got drunk watching David Attenborough's Blue Planet and have a purple carpet. There's no magic there, it's just abstraction. That's the way that we build ideas. We put two things together, come up with a new one. Now, idealism is really the business of taking these abstractions to their extremes, <coughs> shorn of their original trappings. In 50 years' time, no one who worships the great purple octopus will know that I made it up well drunk. It'll have a life of its own, complete with a Wikipedia entry. 
The rest of the world's religions can really be subject to similar analysis, in their particulars at least. But idealists are not all religious, or rather not all belong to recognised religions. This at least is the particular content of religion, all of the, you know, the eight-limbed Ganeshes and winged snake gods. Uh, of all you know, their particulars really come from this abstraction business. Yeah? But as we will see, the general form of religion, certainly in the West, is something very different. I now want to go on to my second part, which I described as the mathematical. Now, as I said, our individuality emerges from our communication with each other. Uh, as, uh, I mean, from Hume. I mean, uh, you know, Hume sort of said that you know, there's no real person, there's just you know, sense impressions. You know, to say that there's like an ideal person is just a myth, you just can't find one. What happens is that so we share ideas, and from this sharing of ideas, we acquire a perspective on those ideas. Uh, no one is saying that even the pre-civilised human lacks a sense of self. That's something, something different. But our relations of self to group have changed in particular ways over history. And it's these patterns that Marx was analysing in his explanation of history, yeah, from feudalism to capitalism to socialism. Yeah? We do not have the freedom to think what we like, since no thoughts exist before they've been developed and worked up by the human mind, working on its environment. They can't just be lifted from the cosmic shelf. So when we look back in history, we should not, for example, look through a surf's eyes with the mind of a modern proletarian and wonder why they did not think and do a certain thing more in keeping with their circumstances. You know, why didn't the serf like, have a socialist revolution because of a serf? They haven't reached the material conditions on the ground or in the, the development of their culture to have such a revolution. We should instead try to, try to fathom why their thoughts seem so limited. Then we may also realise why we as proletarians have been so poor in loosing our own shackles. We are looking through proletarian eyes, not with socialist, but proletarian minds. Now, this is one of the more difficult parts of my talk, but I hope it will go well. Um, the, basic, the basic pattern of this to mathematics as applied, you know, the mathematics of our relations to each other as applied to history, go roughly like this. You have the slave, who is a chattel who has no relation to their master except as property. There's not really a relationship there at all. They're, they're owned. Yeah? But we start our analysis with Marx uh, with, uh, with the development of, uh, well, really the development of Christianity and the development of serfs from slaves. Now the serf is emancipated from their slavery into a condition of rights and duties to a lord. Yeah? So they're no longer just in an abstract relationship where they're you know, something to be held by the chain and the lash. Yeah? There's now a relationship there. Now the religious expression of this is the personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus, sorry, did I say that like Jesus? <laughs> uh, but uh, the personal relationship with Jesus, one is a person in that Jesus mediates their relationship with God. Yeah? Now, obviously, interposing themselves into this idealist relationship, you have kings and priests, bishops and barons, yeah, who are all prepared to stand in Jesus' stead and do a bit of um, mediating. He says, trying to read his writing. Uh, the serf's practical relation is, of course, with them. So the serf will have a set of relationships, which yeah, in later times were written down. They said, you work so many days on your Lord's land, and you get uh, you so many pints of ale or whatever. And, uh, and that's, that's your, your contract, if you like, with your law. And in Christianity, uh, sorry, in Catholicism, and I think in the Orthodox Church, I'm not sure, the way this is expressed in terms of your relationship with Jesus is your saviour comes from, a good, from good works. You know, that basically you have, if you like, a contract with Jesus, that you go to church and you give alms to the poor when you can, etc., and then you, you know, you're, you're saved. Complete later on with things like um, uh, the confessional and indulgences, etc. The point is, going on from there, that works okay for, for feudal society, but the bourgeois can't have this because the bourgeois wants it all his own way. The bourgeois is emancipated from this feudal relationship in the town into a condition of abstract relationship with the state, mediated by money rather than by Jesus. Uh, the religious expression of this is Protestantism, where everyone becomes their own priest. 
Uh, and in Calvin's, it's uh, very pure and very telling. Uh, the, uh, with Calvin, uh, the prior relationship you know, with priests, with Jesus, etc., is destroyed by saying that we are all preordained. We all, uh, with the elect or with the damned, when we're born. Now, what we then do in society is we demonstrate whether we're elect, uh, whether we're the elect or damned, by how much money we get. Hence, mediated by money. And so success in life demonstrates one's status, whether you're elect or not. Uh, all obligations and duties, the previous feudal ones, uh, are dissolved into the state. Mm -hmm. So now your obligation is only you know, to be rich, etc. So, and this really is where we find ourselves now, alienated and mediated by money. It's been a few hundred years since, uh, since Calvin, but really that's the structure that we have. Now, Marx put that history this way, and I want to use that just so that it's not just me saying what I think. Um, what was the character of the old society? You know, he's speaking in the, the 19th century. It can be characterised in one word, feudalism. The old civil society had a directly political character, i.e. the elements of civil life, such as property, family, and the mode of manner of work, were elevated in the form of senior, uh, seniory, which, yeah, by which he means lawhood, estate and guild, to the level of elements of political life. So all of this is bundled together. Yeah? Uh, in this form, they define the relationship of the individual to the state as a whole. Yeah? But at the same time, he says it completes their separation from the state. So you, know, you only relate to the state in that you have, uh, have these uh, powers or abilities. Uh, right. But yes, the political revolution which overthrows this rule and turns the affairs of the state into the affairs of the people. This is Protestantism, this is you know, the formation of you know, like the, the French Revolution, etc. Yeah. Turns the affairs of the state into the affairs of the people, which constituted the political state as a concern of the whole people, i.e. as a real state, inevitably destroyed all the estates, corporations, guilds and privileges, so it smashes apart like the business where you know, your status in society is, you know, I'm Jones the Steam, I'm Jones the Carpenter, etc. And such and such as a lord, you know, because of you know, their relations in society. It smashes all those apart. Yeah? It's uh, the separation of people from community. The political revolution thereby abolished the political character of civil society. So civil society is basically your work, you know, your private life, etc. Yeah? It shatters it into its simple components, on the one hand, individuals, and on the other, the material and spiritual elements, which constitute the vital content and civil situation of the, uh, these individuals. Well, basically what Marx is saying here is he's saying that whereas previously in feudalism our lives were bundled uh, together, this was our, our relationship via the contract, yeah? now you have like, an abstract relationship of person to state, and civil society is just something out there. It's, it's assumed. In the same way that nowadays we assume, it, well, if we're not socialists, uh, we assume that the way life is is the way life always has been. It's just something that's there. You know, we have an ideal uh, relationship to politics where we may like think about animal rights, we may think about um, this is like religious rights in the state, all that kind of thing. We are pure and abstract individuals in that regard. You know? But where the real work goes on you know, is, is out, out of play. So we can still believe that people should be fed, and at the same time, they not be fed. You, know, you have that alienated split. Anyway, as I say, society goes through these class phases, corresponding to these potential relationships between ourselves as individuals and ourselves as society. You know, serf, bourgeois, and then, uh, uh, and then hopefully us at the end. Right. So these, that hopefully, uh, I've explained what I mean by the mathematical. By mathematical, I mean our class relationships as they develop through history. Yeah? Now together, these two elements, the biological and the mathematical, uh, you know, the mathematical is still related to, to the biological, it still goes on in the mind. It's about how we hold ideas about, our, about each other you know, within our own minds and how we, how we relate to each other and how that develops through history. Yeah? These together, they frame our entire world. Now what I mean by that is that there are no thoughts pre-existing to humans. There's nothing that we can grab out of there. 
before humans there were no human thoughts yeah and we developed to get by you know, uh, to an ancient greek consciousness then a feudal consciousness then a bourgeois consciousness and at each point that is all that we know and at that point we think that this is perfect yeah so for a feudal lord and peasant they don't criticize that relationship they think that that's a perfect relationship until the bourgeois come along through practically exploding it through uh, through their pursuit of, uh, of capital and wealth they then set up a new uh, a new society which has its own new laws which again now come to seem to be eternal laws but are just historically you know, developed let me put it this way in another exercise what I want to do now is I want to try and explain what I mean by thinking being internal because it's something that we don't usually do. We usually use the metaphor of the stars when uh, when thinking about uh, our thoughts as if eternal laws or platonic forms exist somewhere beyond them and above us. Usually when we think about you know, sort of scientific laws when we think about um, you know, if we're religious, you know, religious rules, we tend to think of ourselves Sort of like you know, within the cosmos, if you like, you know, whatever is beyond the beyond is where all of these where all these rules are kept. Yeah. But our thoughts are finite, as I say, built up from nothing and relate not to the universe at large, but only to ourselves. So I want to use a much better metaphor, which I hope you'll take away. A much better metaphor is mining. Yeah. Imagine that we start from nothing in a confined, uneven, wretched space, and by <coughs> slow work. Yeah, and often random digging to expand this space, yeah, which is the growth of our culture, if you like. Yeah, we are together sharing our ideas, developing them, creating more of a cultural space for ourselves, more of it internal. We learn to see the patterns in the rock, the seams, and we start to work critically rather than randomly, uh, un understanding the nature of rock, if you like, mineral mineralogy. And since it's all we know, this understanding is all there is. So. Yeah, so if we all, all, all of our thoughts are rock thoughts, if you like. Yeah, that's all we have, but we don't understand it that way. Now, the strength of different minerals and the lines along which they shatter are, for us, not just physical but philosophical laws, in this sense. That, that frames our lives within this. And when we reach the hardest rock against which our picks find little or no purchase, we think we've discovered all that there is. In the sheen of this smooth rock, we see reflected the paths that we have taken there. Yeah? All the worlds we could have had, all, all the worlds we could have dug for ourselves coming to this shining moment. So when we come to the, the end of what we can do, we think that's the end of all there is. And in the reflection of that, we can then see everything that we've come, uh, come through and we examine it as a totality. Yeah? Now, a utopian sees these limits and tries to achieve perfection within them. Just as we may try to reach for past ideal relations on the earth by regarding our current knowledge as eternal laws and our state as fundamentally a fixed one that needs to be resolved, perfected, so our hypothetical tunnelers see their past works in this perfect reflection, fashioning their old tunnels into perfect shapes to live in. So they think this is all there is. And because of that, they start going back and uh, creating new worlds creating the old world in, uh, in image. Now, a communist in this sense is a mineralogist. They know from past study of the rock that this is a temporary setback, no more. Even though their tools cannot yet get a purchase, you know, we can't get through this. But we can look at like our history of struggle through the rock, and we can see that there's something past this, we can follow the scenes, and we know that this isn't all there is. Yeah? So even though our tools can't yet get a purchase, we keep going. We don't admire our reflection in the mirror like the utopians do. Instead, we're disgusted by our chocolatistic existence. We don't want to be here. Yeah? We don't just want more space, which is like a relative demand. We want the open air that lies beyond this rock prison. There's criticism of the mind, examining the face for flaws, cracks and weak spots. But the real work begins when the pick is swung. Contemptuous of the utopians, a red cross is painted on our perfect mirror, where it will where it will shatter the easiest, and the call is made for every swinging pick to join in a world of destruction. I said pick. 
Please accept us. Likewise on the earth, as communists, we are little interested in the so-called eternal laws of our current world. Be they on politics, economics, or whatever, we are not here to work within our limitations, we're here to overthrow them. As a party, we should say that the Red Cross should be written on a ballot box. That's what we say at the moment. That's where the pit goes in. You know? We're committed to the ballot box. Whether we should rely on that uh, forever is a question for another day. But we take a dialectical approach to knowledge, knowing that no laws are eternal, and the only thing stopping us breaking through capitalism is our lack of faith in ourselves and our collective action to keep swinging until the state breaks. Contempt of our current condition, both our poverty and our alienation, must drive us forward. So, since we are going over, transcending, current arrangements, must we swing at random? No. As pointed out before, social relations are part of a cycle of human development, this mathematical structure of relations that I've discussed, uh, that has not yet finished, and we can chart its potential future development. We can look back through history and see where we could go. Now, if I can find the right place this time, I want to uh, go to Marx again and his excerpts on James Mill, who puts the past where we are and where we're going very well. Now, he says in capitalism, this is the alienation that we face. I have produced for myself and not for you just as you have produced for yourself and not for me. In itself, the result of my production has just as little direct relation to you as the result of yours to me. That is to say, our production is not production from man to man. It's not social production. I hope everyone will excuse that the man can insert woman or human uh, as they sit there. Um, as men, manly men, none of us has a claim to enjoy the product of another. As men, we do not exist as far as our mutual productions are concerned. Hence our exchange cannot be the mediating movement that confirms my product for you, because it's an objectification of your own need, uh, nature, your need. He goes on, but basically what he's saying is he's saying that in many ways, uh, the capitalist, the simple capitalist alienating re uh, um, uh, relation goes on to destroy our entire society. It leaves us both poverty-stricken and poverty-stricken in the mind, in our relations with each other. Yeah? But then he goes on to say, well, what would socialist relations be? He says, let us suppose that we are produced as human beings. In that event, each of us would have doubly affirmed himself and his neighbour in his production. In my production, I would have objectified the specific character of my individuality. So I say what I can do. This is why I'm on this earth. That's why I'm, this is why I am. And for that reason, I've both enjoyed the expression of my own individual life during my activity. And also, in contemplating the object, I experience an individual pleasure. I experience my personality as an objective, centrally perceptible power beyond all sh shadow of doubt. Look at, what, look at me, look at what I've made, look at what I've done for the community. Two, in your use or enjoyment of my product, I would have the immediate satisfaction and knowledge that in my labour I have gratified a human need, i.e. that I had objectified human nature, and hence had procured an object, an object corresponding to the needs of another human being. So I'm not just Sir Robinson Crusoe on my island. You know? I'm part of society. I have, if you like, a world historical character. I am doing for the rest, for the rest of humanity. You know? I am confirmed in myself as I work for other people. This is what makes me, me. Three, I would have acted for you as the mediator between you and the species. You know? Thus I would be acknowledged by you as the complement of your own being as an essential part of yourself. You need me. You know? I thus know myself to be confirmed both in your thoughts and your love. Four, in the individual expression of my own life, I would have brought about the immediate expression of your life. And so in my individual activity, I would have directly confirmed and realised my authentic nature, my human communal nature. He says, our productions would be as so many mirrors from which our natures would shine forth. Now, this is the kind of relationships that are not an apotheosis. Yeah? This is just basically what we lack that seems so far up the tunnel because of how deep we are in capitalism. 
because of how poverty stricken and alienated we are. These are the kind of relations that we know that we could have just by looking at the way that we've existed in the past, looking at past history, past tensions, and the way that those have developed. This should lead us towards the kind of contempt and disgust that I've been discussing so far. So, I don't know how long that was. Um, I think to I think to conclude, my point is in saying the curse of looking backwards is that whenever we think that we are projecting an, uh, an ideal future, using the terms of today, we are not. Yeah? If we think we're using logic, if we think we're using to, you know, the, the materials that come to us from our from our schooling. All of these things are quite probably useless to us. You know? What we need to do is we need to analyse our situation mm -hmm. dialectically and then go forward regardless. You know? We need basically, where necessary, we need to kick it till it breaks. You know? That socialism is not an abstract future. Socialism, well, as Marx put it, communism is the actual movement that abolishes the state of things. You know? This is where I'm trying to go with this. That utopianism is counter-revolutionary because it stands in the way of us putting our own position, which, as I say, is to be creatures that are fully constrained, that we know exactly what we are. And since, as I was looking at you when I thought of that, <laughs> and since we know where we've come from, we know where we can go, and we know what the rewards will be. Yeah? So, any questions?